Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. I don't even know where to start with this second episode. This was epic. This is the second episode of the two-part series based on service to others. And this one is just in a league of its own. Like... I can't I can't overstate how many times I would recommend you to rewatch both the first and second episode, but especially the first part of the second episode is just a it's just a masterpiece riff of service to others and really making that decision and beginning the path, beginning the f- path of fine tuning yourself from the stinky little pond into a free flowing river that accumulates spiritual mass and and balances between love and wisdom to reunite with the source, with the ocean. So it's just a mind blowing, wonderful episode. Enjoy. All right. So welcome back. This will be part two of the service to others topic. Mm -hmm. So we just addressed sort of the stages and person consciousness, shepherding consciousness, the mirror state, just briefly as a platform or backdrop for um, inspiring the individual to move along that uh, ladder of frequencies of states yeah. of consciousness and we've addressed how and if you haven't seen the previous episode just watch that first because it lays down a quite mm-hmm. a dense background that is very helpful for you to more fully understand the more subtleties that we would be addressing in this session um and we talked about that initial starting point of going from person consciousness to shepherding consciousness and how it requires an activation of self-honesty, sincerity, the seeking impulse needs to be reawakened within us. We need to be sort of sick and tired of our complacency and the boring mm-hmm. nature of some of our as, the aspects in our life. And we want to have this zest for adventure and for mm-hmm. radiating towards others and for making a difference. And that will help us kick us out of our personalized bubble of stagnated thoughts and suffering. Mm-hmm. I'll make us more life. It can be an uncomfortable transition because any genuine deep change typically comes with some discomfort and confusion, but there's enough t- of tools and inspiration out here and in these sessions to help you facilitate that journey. If you really want it, it's not that difficult. You just got to really want it. So then assuming that people have busted, predominantly at least, busted the bubble of person consciousness, And that stinky little pond of person consciousness, which is neither intentionally selfish nor intentionally selfless, it's just kind of indifferent and complacent. And therefore it starts to fester with all kinds of sort of selfish notions and like a need for, like absolute need for comfort and safety and security and planning things ahead of time and all that. (laughs) Versus sort of that more adventurous life where one begins to gain spiritual mass, as we described. Mm -hmm. Again, watch the first episode to hear the description of gaining spiritual mass. That charge through acting on the polarity that we've chosen, which in this case is service to others. And one note also, service to others doesn't mean you don't take good care of yourself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't learn about your own boundaries and about how much energy you have to be of service per day, so to speak. Uh, and that you don't nourish yourself. It also includes service to self, but from the vantage point of wanting, if we see ourselves as a vehicle that can be of service to others, we need to put fuel in the vehicle. Right. We mm-hmm. need to maintain the vehicle. We need to give it an oil change. We need to put fuel in it. We need to clean it from time to time. So service to self is crucial in that sense. Then it's not really service to self in a negative sense. It's self-care, it's self-love. Mm-hmm as a way to also then amp up and increase our ability to carry more spiritual strength and radiate even more fully towards others. So it's not a path of self-martyrdom, but it is a path of sacrifice of everything you thought was important to you. And that's a gradual process. And that's where the discomfort comes in. We have to face how full of shit we are, 
how self-deceiving and others deceiving we have become because we become the cesspool of indifferent selfish energies. Take some time to clean out that cesspool. But as soon as, as one of the borders of this little pond breaks open, the pressure of the water becomes too high and the pond breaks open on one side, it starts to turn into a river that again is activated and is picking up speed towards the ocean, which in this mm -hmm. case is the mirror being or God state. And that whole journey from the stinky little pond of the person consciousness of the indifferent complacent state of the victim to this activated courageous entity that learns to more and more subtly be of service to others to more and more refine its balance of love and wisdom it picks up that um, that spiritual charge that spiritual strength that spiritual mass and it begins to accelerate its flow of the river through those higher density states of consciousness through the subtler nuances of that into a really holistic unified understanding of oneself that is prime mm -hmm. to with a great charge with great spiritual aliveness and vibrancy to realize the God state as its own true self and merge with the ocean more fully. So what we're describing now, in part one, we described going from the stinky little pond to beginning to turn back into a river, which clears out all the, all the festering like bacteria and stuff. And mm -hmm. a river is naturally mm -hmm. quite clean because it flows, right? If we don't flow, we become stagnant and indifferent and complacent and we lack the strength and the momentum and the power to move. The shepherd develops that strength and that power once again, reawakens that. So now in part two, we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, what if I've already made that choice? It's already been a fundamental life change for me. Mm -hmm. And I've already been radiating to others and I'm already on this path. I already no longer believe that I'm just a physical body in a physical world and that I need to make sure that I'm sure uh, that I'm certain and secured and that I have what I need to have. And I've already freed a lot of that up and I'm already looking more and more towards how can I be of service to others? And what do I need to be of service to others rather than what do I need to be safe until death do me part from this body, which is a very boring lifestyle in my eyes. And it doesn't do you justice because you're an infinite being, an eternal being. So it's a state of self-hatred. To be person consciousness bound is a state fundamentally of self-despise, self-hatred. Complacency is a state of self-hatred. Cool. Self-love is becoming of service to others and seeing what do I need to change within myself and activate and what do I need to have to an extent? How do I need to design my life to be supported to be of service to others? That's where the self-care comes in. Now I'm picking up flow, I'm picking up momentum, spiritual charge, spiritual strength, spiritual mass. And with this mess comes a greater vibrancy. I'm much more able to malleably navigate my life and the challenges don't seem as daunting anymore. And I'm attracting support and abundance in different varieties of ways to help me navigate this because I'm more and more sincere. I'm building more and more of the love thoughts and less of the safety thoughts, more and more of the activated thoughts of the creator, seeing myself more and more as an infinite eternal being that is powerful and able to be of service to others. So now we gain that momentum of the river, it starts flowing faster, it leaves the stinky pond behind. Now we're addressing the second stage of that journey. How does this river become fit to merge with the ocean? How does the illusion of the mind body spirit complex in the higher more ethereal sort of understandings of itself, the subtler nuance, more nuanced understandings of itself? How does it prime itself? How does it accumulate even more spiritual mass, but in such a balanced way that it becomes a precise vehicle tuned for unity with the creator in an actual experiential manner, not just a dry picture manner that the person consciousness often does when it, when it learns about enlightenment teachings and non-duality and oneness, where it just takes a picture of those concepts. And then as a person consciousness, it's like a stinky little pond, but um, on top of it are floating all these pictures of enlightenment. <laughs> And it's like kind of covering it up. Of the and, ocean. Yeah. yeah. And like pictures of the ocean. Nice. Even better. All these pictures of the ocean floating around this stinky little pond. And now the stinky little pond can hide its complacency and its self-hatred and cover it with pictures of the ocean. <laughs> once that's been left behind, once that's been ascended from, transcended, integrated, known about, faced, acknowledged, accepted, and decided that's not who I want to be. That 
doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel true to my strength, my eternal being, my potential. It doesn't fulfill my potential. It's not really helping anybody else. I don't want to live in a frequency of fear and self-hatred and complacency. I want to live in the frequency of love and light and adventure and radiance and spiritual strength. Because I know that's who I am, so I'm going to love myself. And sometimes you need a kick in the butt. You need to realize how full of shit you are to shock you into awakening. And if you don't do that by my words or words from people similar to myself, then you're going to attract much more catalytic experiences into your life through your own free will at a higher mm -hmm. self level to wake you out of this. Maybe you'll develop terminal cancer. Maybe something terrible happens in your environment that you don't want to happen that forces you to question yourself. So develop a respect to people that kick your butt, whether it's friends, family, or teachers. Begin to fall in love with getting your butt kicked because that's what you need. That's a self-loving act and it's an act of loving others sometimes is when it's asked for, when it's appropriate, when it's your own platform to demonstrate that passion so that they can match the vibration of that passion for life. They can see that they've been festering in this little pond of complacency and fear and self-despise. And therefore the urgency and the seeking impulse is reactivated, reignited. That's love. There's very few people that can give you that in a deliberate way. So appreciate it. Don't despise it or you're only going to attract more suffering to yourself. This is the easy path. Getting your ass kicked is the easy way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a loving nice. act. It's because if you don't get your ass kicked, you'll get your ass burned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you won't be able to sit for years. <laughs> so waking up is something you have to decide for yourself. I want to wake up. I'm ready to start streaming towards the ocean, rushing towards the ocean with great zest for life passion for radiating news to others. So, okay, then how does that change? So once I've activated that and I'm well on my way and I've self-transformed myself, I've acknowledged a lot of the ways in which I fooled myself into complacency. And now I'm more self-honest. I'm more transparent. I'm more fearless and I'm more activated. I'm more passionate and I've rearranged my life and I've been of service to others for quite some time. And I attempt to do a better, cleaner, purer job every day. I contemplate, I meditate and so forth. Now what becomes available to you once that has been integrated is the subtler balances of love and wisdom. And this deserves its own sort of context or explanation. Again, a lot of this is inspired by the law of one language. So if you're interested in the original languaging of this, you can check out the law of one or the raw material as it's also called. Love and wisdom. Third density is that of person consciousness. And it's that where, where you make the choice, do I wish to be of service to self or do I wish to actively be of service to others? Once that choice has been made, one enters into the realms, the lessons of fourth density and beyond. Fourth density, and you could see this as different dimensions. Um, I'm not going to go into this too deeply now because it'll be a little bit conceptual to you most likely. Um, and it's not my main message, but it is a little bit part of the explanation of love and wisdom. So first density describes the dimension of basically what we perceive as inert matter, like, like a uh, rock or water or air. Second density is what we would see as, um, anything that kind of moves and grows like plant life, uh, even microbial life, uh, even crystal life, uh, trees, and finally animal life forms, um, and pets. Third density is that state of the creator in the form of the spark of an individuated self that now is able to self reflect to know that it is to know that it exists, which the animal and a tree and a crystal and a rock doesn't really have in the same way. And we teach it to our pets through calling them names, rewarding them, punishing them, whatever. They develop a sense of self through that and they become primed. Their consciousness that is sort of linked to that vehicle, that physical expression, gains awareness of self because we 
with our third density consciousness are giving it an identity. So it becomes aware of itself more and more. And therefore it becomes primed for third density vehicular incarnation, such as our humanoid bodies. This is a vehicle for self reflection for self awareness. And in this self awareness, at some point, the choice in order to progress into a fourth density, just like the pet progresses into self awareness, the lesson to going from third density to fourth density, the prerequisite is that of love. Fourth density is the vibration of love or understanding. So we need to attain love. Now this can be deliberately done as love for self over others. It sounds ironic and weird why someone could progress in that way, but it is just the way that things are set up. It's part of the polarity of the creator expressing itself in this illusion. So it's possible, but again, we're not addressing that path because we're assuming your service to others oriented. Even though you might have selfishness as part of your personhood conditioning, we're going to assume that you are in your heart, so to speak, service to others oriented, and that that's your desire. If not, then this is probably not for you. So, but before one can activate this vibration of love, love for the whole, love for others, and therefore also love for self, because that's incorporated in love for others, you could also call it love for all, including self, but it's symbolized more actively as a tool, as love for others. That's the path. And you will inevitably begin to love yourself through that journey. Because you can only progress so much without forgiving and loving yourself and, as well. Mm -hmm. And you start to even see yourself as another self at some stage. And then you realize, oh, I have to also love myself. Mm -hmm. Because to not love myself is another middle finger to the Creator, because I too am one with the Creator. So it's hypocritical to love others at the expense of oneself. It might be a tool to gain that initial momentum for some people, that sort of self-sacrifice and martyrdom. But later on, when you start to learn the balances of love and wisdom, which is what we're about to get into, wisdom also suggests we should love ourselves, we should nourish ourselves as part of our trajectory of gaining spiritual mass through service to others as a symbolized activity. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a full sentence, but people can pause and rewind. So then what's crucial in third density, which is kind of what at a manifest level where most of us are experiencing today, is that we make the choice, really the choice to be to activate ourselves along the polarity path of service to others. Once we do all these doors open up the spiritual metaphysical strength and the doorways and pathways they open up to us very naturally. We become a fuller being a more cosmic being. We understand ourselves at a higher meta level. We're less, we feel less limited and less like a victim of this world. More like there's sort of a symbiotic interconnectedness mm -hmm. and that I'm at least partially creator of my own life, if not fully. We become honest and so forth. But that requires that we're even interested, that we're no longer indifferent and just like kind of going through the motions of life as it's taught to us. We have to be active, free will, in a sense, independent thinkers, independent um, seekers. We got to have this passion, this standalone passion that I can carry myself with this energy. And I want to contribute to the lives of others. I want to share love and light. And I want to transform myself in the process. Once we have that, now we, in order to become fit for fourth density, we need to attain that to the point of love. And so fourth density is the density of love. Then beyond that is fifth density, which is the density of wisdom. And then beyond that is sixth density, which is where the pathways come together and the polarities are resolved into unity. Once the lessons of love and wisdom, love and wisdom, love and wisdom have balanced each other out and they've incorporated the views of each other. So there's not the extreme of love where I'm just like actively trying to save the world without any regard for myself or without any sort of understanding of how other people have their own guidance and their own free will. I just kind of want to help. I just want to love. But I run into challenges when I do it that way. And wisdom, if visualized exclusively, like in the extreme side of wisdom, it's like, nobody needs me, everyone is self sufficient. Uh, the light of the higher self shines upon all entities evenly. Nobody needs me. Um, I'm not that interested in active service. 
I kind of just feel like being by myself, meditating and studying philosophy and meditating <laughs> on the inner light <laughs> and mm -hmm. kind of developing a yogic self-contained mm -hmm. lifestyle that is active, spiritually active, but it's no longer as active outwardly towards service to others actively. The compassion seems to be lacking a little bit, it doesn't have to be, but it's taking on a different shape, the shape of wisdom, of the inner light, focusing more towards the inner light and less towards the outer love or compassion. It's still love-based if it's service to others, polarity and the charge in the entity is service to others. It's still love-based, but it takes on the shape of wisdom and sort of a retraction, inwardness. In Letting sense. people learn their own lessons. Letting people learn their own lessons, not meddling with things, mm -hmm. and also not risking. And there's also sort of an attachment to that detachment mm -hmm. of like, mm, I don't, nah, it's kind of, every time I do reach out, it's kind of like messy, messy yeah. in a sense. Mm -hmm. And like, let people learn on their own and I'm going to focus on the inner light, the self-sufficiency within myself and attain greater spiritual wisdom perfectly fine and natural portion of the soul's journey into unity and ultimately into oneness with the creator. Then that also is not sufficient. That's not balanced. It's still mm -hmm. one end of the spectrum. So now in the sixth density vibration, in order to be fit for sixth density, we need the vibration of unity consciousness and the holistically integrated, unified, individuated soul balanced, a completely balanced being, still relating to the world and itself to some degree as an individuated mind, body, spirit complex. The illusion is still present of self and the world, but it's very transparent to the God state and wants balance and wants equilibrium is very balanced. It's very pristine. It's very clear. And so one's choices, one's interactions as catalyst appears, as opportunity appears in one's world experience, the choices made from that state become more and more and more, the higher we go along the path of shepherding consciousness, the closer that this river gets and accelerates towards unity with the ocean, the oneness in seven density, which is that density of completion or allness or oneness. Before that oneness, in a sense, the individual needs to be unified self. It needs to face every aspect of itself, accept and love every aspect of itself, and yet not be bogged down or held back by ever any aspect of itself. It needs to have that whole picture. The way to do that most effectively is to continue to service to others, but now balance love and wisdom. So in the later stages of the river flowing towards the ocean, becoming fit for un union with the Creator, it wants more and more to fine tune its service to others with a balanced view where their love is infused with wisdom, or you could say the wisdom is infused with love. But then after fifth density, the entity becomes again more available for active service to others. But now it's viewed with this deep background of wisdom, mm. of respecting people's free will, mm. of understanding how each entity has their own higher self. And the respect of free will is very connected to the balance of love and wisdom, to understand the nature of free will and to know how to respect that, to still be of active service, but with respecting that free will. This is the journey of the later stages of shepherding consciousness, which you don't have to wait until you are in that density in an active physical vehicle, so to speak. Although it wouldn't be physical as we know it. But you don't have to wait until your incarnation in that density. You can have all that learning take place right here, right now, while you are physically third density active in a physical form. So then the shepherd, as it develops more spiritual mass and understanding and strength, that balance becomes more and more fine tuned. So if we kind of picture it like the shape of if you were to look at a teepee from the side, but just a two dimensional mm -hmm. teepee, just the lines that go from wide to higher, higher and closer together, closer together until they merge in that sort of mid six density state, which is represented by the state or function of the higher self of the individual that's available to any sort of lower density expression of the individual soul. 
But our aim as an individual expression of our soul is to become of that frequency of unity. And so in our active choices, we now start to really see sort of the joke almost, or like the setup of how we're being challenged with situations that ask us to balance love with wisdom and wisdom with love. It really becomes an active, very visible challenge to a higher level shepherd, shepherd who has gained more momentum and understanding. Any thoughts on this so far? I'm mostly just interested in how to best balance or mm -hmm. like what some of these main balancings are like sort of the most common. Yep. So if there's a situation or a challenge or some kind of a relationship dynamic or a breakup or an argument, or someone's asking for help, but it seems like it's a sort of a complex situation. And in order to say yes to being of service, you have to say no to something else that seems valuable. Or if you say yes to the service, then you're going to be perceived in this and that way, or it's not going to be understood. Or da -da -da. You get more complex puzzles from your higher mm -hmm. self to train you in the subtler balances of love and wisdom. You get complex situations that you don't really get on your plate in the earlier stages, mm -hmm. just because you always get what you need and what you can handle. Higher self is not masochistic, it doesn't want to hurt itself, its own expressions, it doesn't want to hurt its own incarnation. So it's not going to go give you a lesson that you have no capability or availability to understand. So these sort of more complex opportunities for service to others, to fine tune the balance of love and wisdom, will inspire in us sort of both sides, like, we'll feel sort of the inclination towards acting on it, which is typically that love impulse. Like, oh, yeah, I, I want to help you. And, but if it's not balanced with wisdom, it is prone to attachment. It's love and service mm. with attachment to outcome, with attachment to their well being with an attachment to them getting it, mm. maybe, or them using the aid that's provided. Whereas wisdom, a wisdom inclination would be a, an attachment to detachment right? Because it's not a completely balanced detachment, it's an attachment to detachment, mm -hmm. it's still in a sense, personal, it's still a preference. Whereas the sixth density entity really begins to be free of preference. That's where the balance comes in. And that's where you can be of active service without attachment to outcome, and without preference for detachment either. So now you're sort of ready to again, get your hands dirty if mm. need be. But you're going to do it in as clean a way as you possibly can to the best of your wisdom without attachment to outcome. So, I mean, it's a complex, very subtle and nuanced experiential journey. So it's difficult to really put this into sort of a formulaic language or methodology that people can apply to every situation like a law book or something like that. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. People have to discover this for themselves. I can only kind of suggest and hint at what this sort of is like. But people can already begin to recognize how every opportunity for service that arises in them, maybe your child needs something, or maybe your partner wants something, or maybe the world or your community is asking for something. Or maybe you just have the vision of what humanity could be like, and you're inspired by that. You will find within yourself, both the inclination to say yes and no. And the balancing of that is kind of to say neither yes or no, but to allow for spontaneous service to others to occur through you intelligently and clearly without it swaying you into preference, without it swaying you into feeling responsible ultimately for the result or how they interpret it or take it or utilize it. So no attachment to how your message or your service is interpreted. And where you are still attached to how your message is received or interpreted or utilized to the outcome of it, that's still where your personal ego is involved. And so this is a perfect opportunity to then uh, surrender that egotism and therefore become of an even purer vibration that's even more clean and in a state of equilibrium, yet charged, not equilibrium, like the blank state that's kind of like dry, where the person consciousness has covered up its complacency with pictures of enlightenment. Mm. No, this is an active, highly vibrant, highly loving and aware state 
of equilibrium, equanimity. It's not just like, oh, I'm not going to respond to this or that. No, it's all inclusive. It doesn't shy away from anything, but at the same time, it doesn't get attached to anything. Um, well, I just like the point about attachment being a hallmark of love. Like you, that's one of the byproducts of having a love imbalance is that there's the attachment associated with it. And the first place that I can think of having attachment is being understood, like making sure that my intentions are understood. So even if I'm doing something that's kind of like a wisdom thing, like being more harsh or giving some sort of a reflection, I still have this attachment to having them know that my intentions are good and that, that they understand where I'm coming from. So that feels like a tough one to give up. Yep. So then the love example would provide the service and would explain itself and its intentions when perhaps that's not the most appropriate version of service in right. that moment. The wisdom inclination at the more extreme end of the spectrum would either just not respond to that situation, would not attempt to help, would see that the foolishness of the situation or the questioner is self-created by the questioner or the participant. And you sense that they're not really that genuinely interested or ready for whatever reflection you could have. And maybe you will offer a reflection, but you'll offer it without really an attachment to how it's perceived. Mm -hmm. And if you do, it just reinforces the feeling of, oh, this is messy. Let me pull back more. <laughs> um, or let me just not say anything. It doesn't mean you're not loving, but it's a withdrawal of yeah. active service. Then the sixth density, if indeed it feels like out of the free will of that entity, you are you're requested for your reflection or your assistance, whether physical or mental or verbal, or just vibrationally, by presence. From that unity where love and balance are wisdom, uh, where love and wisdom are balanced, you would provide what is requested, most likely, unless you recognize, no, it's not in the highest interest. Mm -hmm. But if it is, if it feels that way, then you would provide the reflection. You would also understand through your experience that they're not fully going to get it. You're going to realize that they might rebel against it. Their egos might rebel against it. If it still feels, however, that it will plant a seed and it will help them, you will most likely provide it because you're not attached to detachment. And, but at the same time, while you're doing it, you already see the response coming and you're not swayed by it because it's not about you anymore. It's not personal. You're actually being of service to them, regardless of the consequences to your self image, your self esteem wow. and so forth. So that's that's, yeah, that's a good awesome. Example. And that's advanced. That definitely feels like. Yeah, you got to like give up the harmony or the the dynamic that that I can feel that I'm attached to in most relationships is some level of just it feeling good together. Like there's some being some sort of mutual harmony mm -hmm. in order to be completely of service. So those are remnants of sort of the person that's evolved into the shepherding consciousness, but it's still more egotistic than you're ready for. It's not the mirror state. Right. Right. So it's presented to you so that you can purify more of that egotism and really become of the state of clarity and reflectiveness and mirrorness mm. where you respect their free will and whatever is requested on some level, it's not always conscious to them, but you reply or you respond to that lovingly, willingly with an availability, but impersonally, yet it not being an attachment to detachment. It's not impersonal in the extreme either. It is loving and caring, but without personal attachment to the outcome. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what attachment to detachment would look like? Like what that is in this situation, for instance? Well, where you don't want to get involved. Oh, just avoid it in general. Yeah. Yeah. You prefer your detachment. Right. Right. Yeah. Very familiar. Which is still personal. That's also a form of egotism. Yeah. It's a wisdom imbalance. Cool. Cool. Thanks. What are some of the other challenges or concerns that come up when there's an opportunity for you to be of service? What about when... And, and by the way, every situation is an opportunity to be of service, cool. right? Mm -hmm. So it may not be like someone asking you for your help. It might just be an argument you got into with someone or you bumped into somebody or someone calls you and they're not asking for help, but they're presenting a story and it's an opportunity for service to others. 
It's an opportunity to gain greater polarity and greater balance of love and wisdom, and therefore greater equilibrium and transparency to the God state, therefore red, greater ripeness and readiness to that droplet merging back into that oceanic sense of love, light, bliss, where the world in a sense disappears and everything is realized to be of the nature of that God consciousness. Where it's truly no longer about you, that like you are universal in nature, in essence, in your self-knowledge. So every uh, every situation is an opportunity for that practice. I just feels like it takes such quick processing to like know what direction someone needs to be reflecting in, reflected in. Like I got, I get a flashback from um, a time we were together driving, um, and like I got out of the car and bumped the car next to us with the door. Do you remember this? And the guy got upset and he was pissed and he was trying to, I don't know, he's kind of. Mm -hmm, vaguely. Yeah, yeah so he's really back. upset, really upset. So it was the girlfriend. There was two people in their car. They're really upset about me having bumped the car. And I was like nervous. I was like, Sp <laughs> and um, they were just kind of trying to intimidate us into something. And you just like got out and said, how much is it? And just paid them the amount that they asked for. And it was so it was like, I wouldn't, I thought maybe the reflection would be to give them some sort of harsh reflection back or, but it was just to like, not make it a big deal was the service in that moment, just to pay and like diffuse it and sort of not validate their big dramatic scene. But yeah. So the reason it, it, I'm starting to remember it, um, the reason why I did that, because sometimes I would give them a harsher reflection if, if it was erratic and imbalanced. But what I felt, according to memory, is that I remember feeling in that moment that what would actually teach them and diffuse the situation, not the situation, but because I'm not interested to diffuse situations, that would be an attachment to detachment. Nice. So the fifth density approach would be, I'm just going to pay them and be, so that it's not a big deal. Um, and let them be whatever they, it was still an active service where I realized I could plant a seed. And so it's a case by case basis. And it requires this intuition, which requires having attained spiritual mass and spiritual strength and clarity beyond the physical senses. So what I sense is that if, if I pay them now respectfully and lovingly, it like, it's such a contrast to the interaction they're having within themselves that they'll be kind of taken aback yeah. by the ease and mm -hmm. the, in a sense, love mm -hmm. that was present to where they will see the consequences of their own intensity. They will face it themselves. They will, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. it's kind of like when you're really mad at someone and they just kind of suddenly relax and they're no longer fighting back. You kind of become aware of how erratic you've been. When someone just suddenly is quiet or gives you what you wanted, which you were crying for like a little baby <laughs> and now you get it. And then you kind of you're feel like, like an asshole. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You feel like, uh, okay, I'm kind of, that was kind Sorry. of childish of me. <laughs> so that was the approach behind just paying them. It wasn't just to diffuse the situation. It nice. was to provide learning. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it felt. But at, that's my point in a way is like how, what fast processing it seems to take. Mm -hmm. Although I realize that from your perspective, it's, it's actually, having accumulated the spiritual mass, it's actually a momentum that you've already built more so than processing in the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we become more anchored in the mere being state, uh, which is sort of late sixth density, early seventh, then like I said, service to others is automatic. So you'll automatically respond in a balanced way. And where you don't, it's just a remnants of your own self doubt, a doubt in the mirror state based in social conditioning of like, oh, I shouldn't say this right now because this is not expected of me. Or if I do this, I'll look like an asshole. Or if I do this, I'll look too passive and like I'm not standing up for myself or those kinds of images. If that doubt really isn't there, the response is automatically pristinely wise mm. and loving mm. Mm -hmm. and balanced automatically. So it's not, doesn't take processing. The processing is the doubt oh. in the mirror state. Oh, wow. But that only happens if sufficient spiritual mass experientially has been acquired. One cannot be complacent and say, oh, whatever I felt like reacting was the mirror state. That's very different. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the process of analyzing it is definitely required. But when you over and over analyze this over and over again in all these opportunities, and you vibrationally, not intellectually, vibrationally attain a state of equilibrium and clarity and impersonality of universality, universal love, balanced with wisdom, then naturally, what will come forth from you is the most balanced approach, even when to bystanders, it may seem like imbalance towards love, or wisdom, or even sometimes a personal reaction, because sometimes the best way to be of service is to personally react, because that's the language they understand. If you try to impersonally teach her react, they won't be able to grok some of that. So sometimes mm. you have to take on the form where you, you don't have to, you just naturally feel like, as long as you don't doubt it, and you've actually experientially, vibrationally established yourself in that mirror state consciousness, then what the intelligence will just inform your body and mind and speech. You're not even thinking about it. It just happens. And after the fact, you may sometimes analyze it and be like, oh, or maybe there's a response like, oh, that was kind of daring. Or, oh, that was seemed kind of weak. I have a judgment about that. And then you can purify that. But if you have a strong connection to that higher density state of consciousness, that balance, you've practiced it over and over and over again, you sacrifice your self image for the greater love over and over and over again. Now this love starts responding automatically. That's why the quickness of it, it's not a mental process. What shall I do? What shall I do? Mm -hmm. That's self doubt that comes from conditioning. That's not how God responds. That's not how this intelligent field responds automatically. That's why the refresh rate is very high. That's why the instruction is immediate. But that requires lots of practice, lots of courage to sacrifice all self image for the sake of the truly pure, sincerest of states and desires and intentions. And then it's automatic. That's why it's quick. It seems quick, but it's not quick. It's just it doesn't require any process. It's immediate. Any more examples? I have one. Um, so what about if you have got close people in your life, whether it's family or friends, and you and their reality have quite large contrast, you almost seem to live in completely different worlds or paradigms, and your world or their understanding of your world um, may cause them some uh, suffering, and they may struggle to understand um, how to approach these kind of um, tensions that you have within relationships or, um, yeah, in a balanced way without it compromising yourself or without you just being completely removed from the situation. So from a completely, like, let's just kind of quantum leap to the highest state mm -hmm. or in the, not the highest state, but the mirror state, mirror being or at least sort of that totally balanced six density unified self where love and wisdom are so mm -hmm. intertwined or so balanced that there's a pristine equilibrium from which there's clarity, there's no personal attachment, yet there's also no attachment to not engaging. There's just a balanced view. How would this balanced view respond if you had no doubts? Can you grok or intuit that in that particular sort of situation? What's immediately obvious? What if you were just a mirror? The first thing that comes up is that I wouldn't even have this kind of a question or consideration. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Because the part of you that has the consideration mm -hmm. is the doubt. Yeah. Mm. It's the remnants of person consciousness that have moved into shepherding consciousness. So those are the doubts. The mirror mm -hmm. has no doubts. Right? Yeah. The shepherd still has doubt. So it, this is a further opportunity to let go of the doubtful parts of you that are rooted in fourth, fifth, sixth density commensurate understandings or lessons mm -hmm. and understand them, not just try to let go of them, but also understand them so that you can actually transcend them, mm -hmm. not just bypass them, actually understand them and therefore no longer perceive them to be of any value because you've got something bigger and greater and more true at your disposal, mm -hmm. the mirror state of pure consciousness. So from that state of pure consciousness, what's the, what's the feeling? What's the automatic response? It's the automatic message in response to that situation. Well, there's just a feeling right now of like everything being well. So you have no, you don't really give any significance or um, meaning towards 
how it happens or how it comes out. So it feels like it would just automatically flow. Um, and there's a state of trust. And just a knowing that in the situation or however you feel called to engage will be right as it needs to be. But all of that process still shows some emotional investment, mm -hmm. you see? Some, some personal aspect of an attachment to an outcome. That per, like, because even the thought, I mean, we're talking advanced level of balance now, but mm -hmm. even the thought, however it will yeah. work out, will work out fine. The mirror doesn't have that thought. Yeah, so true. Because <laughs> that's still based in time. It's still mm -hmm. considering outcomes mm -hmm. that are preferable or not. Yeah. And then it's going to trust wow. that even if it's not preferable, it'll be for the better or mm -hmm. somehow it'll be good and you're going to have faith. That's valuable, valuable. But if we're quantum leaping to the mirror state just for fun. Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be that consideration. Yeah. You would just respond automatically. And now, mm -hmm. so I'm getting to sort of um, your point of this fast pacedness of it or the mm -hmm. quickness of it. Mm -hmm. And again, it's important people don't try to mimic this. Yeah. Yeah. Intellectually or like not. It is, it is very important to analyze your reactions. It's crucial. It's absolutely foundational. But when you do it so much and so deep and you practice the deepening of your sincerity and you surrender and sacrifice your self image over and over again, for the cause of ultimate love and unity with the creator, then you become infused with the intelligence of the creator. And so then you can automatically respond if you're rooted in that state. Mm -hmm. So what would that state do? If let's say, family or friends approach you, mm -hmm. and they project their experience and their interpretation mm -hmm. onto you and they suffer from that. You would re react or no, what, you wouldn't what, react. First of all, what would be the interior experience? Mm -hmm. You would see these things or this, it would sort of pass through your awareness, you'd be aware that it was happening, but it wouldn't have a hook onto you in any way. Mm -hmm. So you would just respond with whatever was available. I think, I don't think you would process it too much or think about it. It would just be automatic. Um, and it could be completely different. You may not know how it would be. It could be completely unexpected, um, but there'd be no judgment. It would just be, you'd be like, oh, okay. And you probably wouldn't even comment if you were harsh or not, it would just be as it was to you. And there's in the mirror state, there's a recognition of them as God. Mm. So not only do you see that everything is divinely guided, also actually their essence is perfected. So that's a, a strong part of your awareness when interacting with others as a mirror is so you don't really see them as others. You see them as God, as you do everything, including yourself. So the polarity and the duality disappears. Therefore, you, don't, you hardly even see the scenario. Because mm -hmm. you're like, you see the truth. They are God. This is the creator interacting with itself. So that's the non dual understanding, or recognition or direct experience that outshines all the other stories. And you're acutely, intelligently aware of all the nuances of what's happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. But that's not your, it's not your direct experience. It's just mm -hmm. available. It's just kind of there on the horizon of your view, but it's not what overwhelms your experience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Is that literal though? Like you're literally hardly aware of the details of the situation. This is very difficult to describe, but yes and no. You <laughs> no, in the sense that you are aware of the details, but it's not your direct experience. Uh -huh. It's like your awareness is locked on to what you are or the truth. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's not mm -hmm. obscured by the details, And so the focus on the details doesn't need to be there in order to understand the details. It's mm -hmm. almost automatically understood in most scenarios. Yet you remember it though. Like you can remember all of these things in vivid yeah. detail. If it's relevant. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So it's a simultaneity. It's like a whole new dimension of sort of that God consciousness is added to your original tiny little dimension of thought and perception. 
that is not it's not debilitated god doesn't take away your your ability to know things it just adds this whole dimension of mm -hmm. itself yeah. <laughs> that uh is just so evident yeah that that's where you navigate from everything is seen as as mm -hmm. if it's on the horizon everything that's detailed and stuff oriented and polarity it's like it's on the horizon but it it's it doesn't obscure this fundamental knowledge of I exist as that one I am is and it's everything. And just with more and more practice, that becomes brighter and brighter and it outshines the appearances. Doesn't mean you don't also know the appearances, mm -hmm. but you don't really. It's not your experience. You know of it. It's like you know of it. It's like now you're looking at pictures of the previous reality mm -hmm. while you're in the reality of the Grand Canyon. You're mm -hmm. looking at a picture of your home front and your family or this or that. Uh, but you're canoeing through the Grand Canyon. So it's like, or someone calls you maybe on the phone, but you're like, wow. Oh yeah, okay, well, I would just do this. Okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, those are just analogies. It's a little hard to describe the simultaneity of it yeah. mm -hmm. and the outshining nature of it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Wow. Where, what, what other people view as reality to you, it seems like just a picture because you're in reality, reality. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more real and awake and lucid and true that it, it's never obscured. Like the picture doesn't obscure your experience of being in the Grand Canyon. Picture of uh, of your family at home or whatever it is mm -hmm. in this in this scenario. Could be a picture of you uh, acquiring wealth when you just started your uh, mentorship with some kind of a motivational speaker. It's like, oh yeah, I remember when I felt that was really <laughs> real. But, it's, but you're in the Grand Canyon. Like, and that picture could never obscure or convince or overwhelm the senses of your real experience it's like that mm. wow i love the grand canyon symbol <laughs> yeah. in this case it's so good nice yeah and that's such an important um, point about you recognizing the other person as god are you recognizing mm -hmm. it all as god everything that's appearing yep. um and that would be the difference from a fourth or fifth density imbalance view you're seeing sort of an imperfection in the other, mm -hmm. as opposed to total recognition of what they are at essence. Nice. So then you see from that state also, there wouldn't be self-concern mm -hmm. or attachment to outcome. Yeah. Nor attachment to not getting attached to outcome. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's neither attachment or, there's neither attachment mm -hmm. nor detachment. There's neither acceptance or rejection. Because all of those would have their roots in separation and you don't see separation. Mm -hmm. This is describing seventh density. Mm -hmm. So that's the higher level mirror stage. Yeah. But how would that respond? It's a, And it's like your own responses are also in the picture. So you are in the Grand Canyon and you, you get presented with an opportunity in the picture there's some kind of issue or problem in the picture, but it's not overwhelming your senses. It's not overwhelming your direct experience. It's not really your direct experience. It's just, you recognize it as out there sort of. Your responses are part of that picture, become part of that picture. They're not really you. And therefore they don't tie you down. And there's no attachment or detachment. That's cool. Even your own feelings, your own emotions, your own assessments of the situation are all part of the picture. Yeah, however mm -hmm. you're utilizing your body, mind, speech, emotional body, and so forth, your personality to respond, maybe, that instantly just appears in the picture, but it doesn't appear in your direct experience. Wow, I like that. Yeah. But wow. I mean, you can zoom back into the picture and like hold it closer and closer, at <laughs> which point it seems real again. And then you zoom back on it. Oh, yeah. okay. So it depends on their rootedness also how clearly, how vibrantly, how much spiritual mass has been gained of the creator knowing itself. Would you say the spiritual mass is the same as like being actually in the Grand Canyon? It's like how much of you is actually rooted there at the Grand Canyon? In a way, in the later stages, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe not perfect analogy for that, but yeah. Okay. In a sense, yeah. Cool. Cool. Is there anything else? To cover this topic yeah one more question yeah um 
like similar to what Corey shared about uh, giving reflections to someone, like when you're kind of seeing some imbalances and you're not being asked for a reflection um, to offer the reflection, like when do you then decide when is the time uh, to offer that person a reflection? Because it feels like then the communication is more on higher self to higher self. So it's more intuitive. Um, like how is that then that communication going or that allowance? When would you decide then to offer the reflection, for instance, if you are in sixth density? If you have to create degree balanced love and wisdom. Yeah. You would not, in most cases, give the reflection unless somehow it is asked for. Mm. You, you would just recognize that intuitively if it's asked for or not. Mm. If it's your position, if it's your duty, your honor, your role, if you're meant to give that reflection, then you will give that reflection. Whereas the sort of more love imbalanced will give the reflection mm. for several reasons. One, because it would love to see the other person that get it. Like it's part of its excitement and love for life. And like other people can also get this, but also typically because there's remnants of that person consciousness that like it loves to be heard and seen for its new wisdom and those play into it. So there's this eagerness like, yeah, I, I know what to say to this. I've experienced it. The fifth density or the, the one who would be more inclined towards wisdom might comment, but might comment with some sense of like, just kind of almost to disregard that stage. Or it would just simply not reply, not respond. Mm. Maybe even walk away if it gets too kind of like annoying. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, this is like, <laughs> kind of a distance. This is a waste of my time. I'm going to go be by myself and uh, read the Yoga Sutras. Um, <laughs> and then the sixth cool. density or unity, the balance of love and wisdom, wouldn't feel any particular inclination to mm. leave. <laughs> or comment or not comment, it would just be in this equilibrium, in this transparent, clear state of impersonal, universal love and wisdom. And it would kind of sense and know when it is appropriate to share or not share. So yeah, sorry, there's no concrete yeah, answer. It no. is intuitive. It has to be lived to be known, mm -hmm. to be understood. There's no hashtag for this. Yeah, yeah. that's perfect. Jamie? I had a similar one, but I yeah, think, go uh, for it. Go for it. I, I think it's, it's fairly similar to Dennis's, but maybe worth exploring. Um, uh, so like a hypothetical situation where maybe you're in a, a small group, you're having a conversation, it's pretty, um, positive in nature. Um, but one of the people, um, and maybe this is a, like a tendency for them to have negative thoughts or negative, just speak negatively. And there is again, no obvious request or no formal request for service, but considering that you know that this is a tendency and you maybe know a way that you can help them. And also there's other people in the room that are having to sort of experience this. Yeah. What, what would be beautiful. So this gives me an opportunity to speak to an additional element, mm -hmm. which is one has to understand one's role in the dynamic of the group also, because that hmm. just like your role as a soldier is different than as an officer or as a general. And you kind of have to appreciate, even though you ultimately no longer identify with it in the higher states of consciousness and spiritual math, in that relative picture of that situation, the better you understand your role, the better you also understand your honor and duty and responsibility in that role. So let's say it's a group setting where the general vibe is just an openness and there's an equality among all people. Nobody is perceived as more or less teacher necessarily. And it's kind of like an open dialogue. There are no generals or officers. There's only soldiers, for example, right? Or there's only officers or only generals. So there's an equality there of perceived position this gets into some more subtle territory, but then you are free to speak, even if interiorly in your interior consciousness, you may be at a level of consciousness that's beyond their understanding, 
But if in the perception of you, you are not beyond their understanding, you have more free reign to speak mm. freely, mm. even when not requested. If the general vibe of the dialogue is sort of open, exploring thoughts, then you can say, well, that sounds kind of negative. You could plant that seed, mm. you could give that reflection. They're not directly asking you, but the general vibe of mm. the setting is sort of open dialogue. Now, interiorly, you might feel like you're beyond it and therefore see it clearly. And therefore you feel kind of like, should I offer this or not? But if you at the same time feel the energetics of the room and you sense that in their eyes, you're just one of them. And therefore they won't give what you say greater credit than their own free will. Now you can end the atmosphere of the, the vibe of what's going on is free sharing. Then you have the freedom to share. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Whereas let's say I would walk into that room and people recognize me as a teacher or their teacher, then they will give greater authority to whatever I say. So I will most likely stay quiet unless directly requested. Mm. Even though maybe your state of consciousness sees the same thing I see, mm. but because they don't have that understanding of you, they don't project that difference. You have greater, you're cloaked, so to speak, by the law of confusion. And therefore you can speak freely without distorting or infringing upon their free will. Whereas in my situation, I would have to be more careful mm -hmm. because I'm perceived differently. But when I'm out and about, that, that's why it changes. I don't respond the same ways, whether requested or not, directly in the same situations. Because if I'm out and about and someone doesn't know who I am and they don't have that picture of me, and they just treat me like another person in a car that they bumped into or whatever, then that gives, even, even though I see everything I see and know, my response can be at their level so I can freely speak as if I'm just another person with an opinion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So then I'm cloaked by the law of confusion. Mm -hmm. You get that? So it also depends on the setting, understanding your own position in the eyes of the ones that you're talking to and how much authority they're giving your voice versus their own awareness or their own free will. And once you understand that and you understand your duty in it. Now, another example would be, let's say that you kind of are the leader of that group for some reason, or it's like a, maybe it's a company and you're team leader, uh, some, some kind of situation like that. Or maybe you are teacher and, or you're just responsible for sort of the general vibe of that group. They may not re directly request it, but if you notice that their negativity is dragging down the wholeness mm -hmm. of the mission, where all the beings in that room have kind of committed energetically to raise the overall frequency and understanding of that group and to be mission oriented instead of make it personal and draw it back into the stinky little pond of person consciousness and ego. If you then recognize something, whether you're an equal foot soldier or whether they perceive you as a general, in both cases, you can, you can understand that it is your duty as either a participant, a foot soldier who has committed on equal note to everyone else, but you're just raising the standard. You're reminding everyone like, hey, this is not what we as a collective unity of equal souls or equal beings have signed up for. Therefore, you're performing your duty. It's not directly asked of you, but you're stepping up in that way. Or if you are perceived as kind of the team leader or you have been granted that position in a company and therefore it's your honor or duty inside of the company structure, or they just kind of naturally gravitate towards you as the leader and they're not so inclined to reflect each other unless you kind of indicate there is something that needs to be resolved. So it's also about understanding how you're perceived, what your position, role, and duty is in this scenario. That also plays into when you're infringing upon free will or when you're imbalanced towards love or wisdom or when you're balanced in your approach and your response and how you respond and if you respond. Nice. So it's a, it's a case by case basis. It's very complex, but it's the higher you go in consciousness, the simpler these complex situations become, the more natural. You just know, you just mm -hmm. get it. You just feel it. You just know it. It's available to you. It's not an intellectual thing anymore. The intelligence informs your body, mind and speech naturally. The less you doubt it, the more pure and balanced your reflections will be. And the less you'll enter into the picture and the more you'll stay aware of the perfection that outshines all of it. Yes. Well, it makes me think one thing I notice about you is you will, you're definitely more quick to 
reflect something if it affects the group dynamic yes or the the mission for instance then if it's just a personal reflection that you sense in someone correct so then it's either because within that relative play that is my duty that is my role as a as a shepherd or leader of that particular group or mission or it can also sometimes be a a defense of innocence that's being infringed upon by one member of the group. Now the innocence that's the ignorance in others that's being preyed upon, whether consciously or not, by this one negative individual or skeptic individual or whatever it might be. And it's lowering the whole vibration of the group. And I see that they're not equipped enough mm. to stand up for themselves. I will then without personal request from that entity or the group, if it is my duty and position, I will then stand up for that. And that's kind of that Shiva energy, mm -hmm. or I mean, Shiva energy has many expressions, but is that standing up, defending the innocence. And so then it becomes my role, even as a mere being, as an aspect of God that has to a great degree realized the God state to be itself. It is then your duty in a sense to respond to situations like that and mm -hmm. defend the ignorance and the innocence against those that are letting their baser natures get the best of them. Make sense? Totally. So you see, it's totally case by case basis. Mm -hmm. it completely depends on every individual in the room and the group dynamic and your duty and your honor, how you're perceived mm -hmm. by others, how balanced you are in your own responses, how much of your own personal reactions are left, how much attachment you have left to the outcome of what's being. So if you're attached to outcome, you cannot navigate this way, mm -hmm. at least not anywhere near flawless. It really requires great self-sacrifice, not in the way of not nourishing yourself and including yourself as loving the, your own mind, body, spirit complex as an expression of the creator itself. It's incorporating you, but self-sacrifice of the ego that identifies with that, mm -hmm. that wants it to be a certain way for its own self, that needs to be relinquished. Not self-care, not self-love, not self-nourishment as portion of the whole, but self-priority that needs to be relinquished. Once that is relinquished, this natural intelligence will operate through you. But before that, you just cannot, you can try to fake it, but you'll just cause a lot of distortions. Mm -hmm. So this mirror consciousness is really kind of a unique thing that can only be attained through genuine, sincere, repeated practice, devotion, sacrifice, surrender, will, discipline, concentration, diligence, sincerity over and over and over and over again. And then you become wise, you become loving because you become like the creator already is within you. You got to iron out all the personal distortions with great balance of love and wisdom towards yourself and others. And then you become a spokesperson or an instrument for that which is the true self of every entity in this illusion of the creator without getting swallowed up by any of your actions or duties. But again, this, I just want to reemphasize, this is high level stuff. And it, it mm -hmm. should be understood that this is a gradual process. Don't try to mimic what I just kind of promoted as a possibility. It'll naturally happen when you're ripe and ready and you've done the work. So focus mm -hmm. on the work, not out of vanity, try to become like a mirror. Mm -hmm. It will not, you will naturally become a mirror. If you do the work, if you're sincere to the core, most people are not sincere to the core. I love you anyway, <laughs> but you're not sincere to the core. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do the work. Any homework? Become sincere to the core. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Ciao. Awesome sessions. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomasaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on bentinomasaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinhoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. 
It's eight long-form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online Global Enlightenment Retreat at BentinoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 